Hello, everyone, and welcome to our quarterly secure stage review, uh, stage strategy review to be specific. Uh, I'm David DeSanto. Most of you know me already, uh, but if you're not with the company, you're watching our video, I'm responsible for our dev section and our sec section, so covering our development focused features as well as our security focused features. Um, at a high level for the stage, we continue to be making progress towards our three year uh, stage themes and three year strategy. A couple of things worth highlighting since the last time we met, uh, DAST has moved to being able to run within production. So this is actually being able to run a DAST on-demand scan. I'm sure Derek will touch on that in more detail, uh, but that's something that uh, recently was completed. Uh, we've also been focused on what's currently going on, which is driving our maturity for our AST leadership, as well as rolling out dog fooding of secure throughout the entire company. The primary item I wanted to highlight for all of you is changes in our target audience. So today we've been able to move both our QA support and our security consultant support forward. We believe we're now a strong map to what QA teams need with regard to security testing, as well as we're now able to begin to support our customers who are security consultants who are using GitLab as a way to manage code they're writing for their customers and then scanning those for security vulnerabilities as well. We're also introducing a new target audience being compliance specialists and managers. And with that today, we see that on our plans and the team will talk about those, but they're not, we're not strongly mapped to that yet. However, over the next medium term, so the next year to two years, we definitely see us getting to uh, being a strong map for SecOps, as well as uh, getting to a good support level uh, for compliance related customers. On the overall strategy for the stage and our maturity, We've been able to move multiple categories forward since the last time we met. This includes fuzz testing is now viable, along with vulnerability management. And we're looking to bring SAST to complete uh, within the March milestone. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the team to start giving updates. And first, we have Matt. All right. Thanks, David. Let me go ahead and share what I got here. All right, so I'll start off with a couple of things that I'm really excited about that recently released. So the first is creating JIRA issues from vulnerabilities. So this is something we added in 13.9 and was actually, I think for me, was the highest customer requested feature in my particular area. So what's really exciting about this is it's the first place inside of GitLab where you can actually create a JIRA issue directly from our interface. Simply enable it at a project level Say you want to create your issues. This will then give you the ability to, so I'm here in a vulnerability detail record and I now have a create your issue button. And it takes me directly over based on the issue type that I've configured and fills in all the vulnerability details. The other thing that I am really excited about that we released is an activity filter. So, the activity filter lets you select any vulnerability records that let's say have had an issue created or perhaps more importantly are no longer detected in subsequent scans. So this lets you drill in very quickly to things that I might be able to, let's say bulk dismiss or as of a few days ago, bulk change status to resolved for issues that are no longer detected in scan. So this is a great efficiency improvement. And I'm super excited because this activity filter was actually a community contribution. So coming up, it was hard to narrow this list down. We have a lot of exciting things. But first, I'm going to start with a generic security report schema. This has been in flight for a while. But really, the goal of this is to provide a single way to integrate virtually any scanning tool or any security tool into the pipeline and have those results appear in the vulnerability management workflow. One of the things that we're doing with this is designing generic formatting. So the scanners themselves can output predefined types and we'll be able to render them inside of the UI. So everything will have a consistent look and feel inside of the vulnerability details. What's really exciting is this also allows for integrating custom tools that don't fit an existing scanning category like SAST or DAST. And all of those will appear 
just like any other tool in one single location in the vulnerability reports and dashboards. On the developer side, we haven't spent as much time over the last year because we've been focused on the AppSec side, really getting the vulnerability management workflows uh, polished up and to that viable level. So we're going to be starting the MR security widget refactor. Now this is gonna be a long process and we have four steps defined, which will probably take us through the rest of the year. But the first is adding some additional um, messaging inside, mostly around error handling to help make things more clear what has actually occurred during a particular pipeline run. We'll also do some minor improvements such as we had a long-standing dark mode issue. So this is gonna be step one in a much broader refactor, which will bring the MR security experience much closer to that of the pipeline and the project and group level, where there is a dedicated security area instead of an inline widget. And then finally, one thing that we did last year was we split the vulnerability management experience at the project and group level into a dedicated dashboard and the vulnerability report for doing the triage and management. We haven't spent as much time on the dashboards, so we're going to look to add more visualization capabilities there. One of the things that we're gonna focus on first is something to help you assess how am I doing in terms of my timing, my remediations. So this is a basic SLA visualization, which shows you aging of vulnerabilities over time. So you can quickly and easily through these two changeable views, see, for instance, let's say I have an SLA of 15 days on criticals. Do I have anything that's aged out of that? So this is gonna be a big benefit for anyone that's trying to keep tabs on performance of their vulnerability management at a project or group level. And those are some of the things that I'm excited about for vulnerability management. And I'll turn it over to the next person. Thanks, Matt. Um, so for the security orchestration category, this one actually is under protect, but this is a category that spans across GitLab. So we're addressing security alert management and security policy management, um, again, across all of GitLab, not just protect. We just barely released security alert management in 13.9, and we have policy management on the roadmap. So I'm gonna be walking us through what we just came out with and what's coming um, in the next three to six months. So security alert management, we just barely released a new alert dashboard. It's here under security and compliance threat monitoring. And you can set this up with your uh, policies using container network policies. You can configure the rules that generate an alert. Um, those can then show up here on the alert dashboard. You can change the status and you can click into these to get all of the details for what actually happened. On the roadmap, we're working to bring policy management across secure and protect. And this involves managing when scans actually get run. We're addressing this in true GitLab style and a very iterative approach. So we have outlined um, you know, a multi-step plan where we get some initial value out to users and then improve on that experience over time. Just to share what we plan this to look like in the first iteration, we're planning to allow you to link to a separate security policy project which will contain a YAML file that will define those policies. Soon afterwards, we want to bring a UI to that experience. So we're going to let you view a list of your policies and edit those policies here in the UI. And to do that, you'll get a, an experience that looks something like this, where you can go in and actually edit the YAML here in the UI, which without having to worry about managing that separate project. Down the road even further, we plan to bring a nice rule editor option to that. So you can either work in rule mode or YAML mode. And so you can actually schedule those scans to run at a certain interval or um, require them to run during the pipeline. One key differentiator of this versus just running scans through the current GitLab CI.yaml file is that we're providing for separation of duties where a security team can enforce these scans and require them to be run in a way that's not uh, editable or able to be disabled by the developers on the project. We're actively collecting feedback in this area. So if you have users with ideas or input in this area, we would love to talk to them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor McCaslin. I'm our product manager with Static Analysis and Vulnerability Research. I'm actually really thrilled that these two teams are working very closely together on a number of different features, which we'll quickly talk about here. So the first thing I want to share is that we um, now support the security and configuration page for all users, allowing any GitLab user to understand what security tools they have access to and to easily be able to enable SAS to via a button click. We'll also be supporting secret detection enablement via a button in an upcoming release. This is part of our usability theme and adds to our MR security widget improvements for core users, making it easy for core users to access the JSON security reports directly from the MR. Together, these features make it easier for any user to get value from our free SAST and secret detection tools. Um, next, I wanna to touch briefly on a number of uh, different features that we've recently released. We've been pushing updates to many of our SAST analyzers to support more types of project configurations like multi-projects and mono-project support. Um, across many of our analyzers, we now support .NET 5, we've expanded our Ruby scanning, we've added additional se severity data to our JavaScript, Ruby, and C and C++ scanners, as well as Node.js. All of these changes together, we have seen a 10% increase in the SAS job success rate over the past few months, which we believe is associated with SAS better supporting these different configurations. Um, next, looking at, at what's coming uh, next, uh, as part of our usability theme, we're actively working to streamline our lint-based SAS analyzers with SEMGREP, which is a popular lightweight stack analysis tool for many languages. This will streamline our analyzers, reducing the cost of maintaining them and open up a consistent method for writing rules across analyzers. This will also provide a nice option for languages that we don't support. You'll be able to write custom rules within SimGrep for arbitrary languages as well. And then finally, with GitLab focused on AST leadership, we're working on multiple efforts to increase our accuracy rates and false positive and reduce false positives. This again is that work between SAS and vulnerability research that I'm really excited about. This is a critical focus for the team for the foreseeable future. We're actively working on releasing a new vulnerability fingerprint tracking system to better identify vulnerabilities in a persistent fashion to reduce false positives. We're also working on post-processing analyzers to validate known high false positive vulnerabilities and to resolve them automatically if they are indeed false positives. Um, all of these efforts roll up together to us really trying to make an industry leading um, accurate and low false positive uh, analyzer. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nicole for definitely scanning. Hey, so share my screen. I'm Nicole Schwartz, and I currently am in charge of the composition analysis group. And we do both the dependency scanning and license compliance analyzers that run in the pipeline. Uh, currently, for the past few months, we've been continuing our work on getting to the complete state of maturity, which involves uh, working on uh, automatic remediation, uh, and I'll show you some of those designs. Uh, we're working to add paths information into our dependencies when you're looking at them, improving merge request approval uh, setup process for the vulnerabilities as well as the license rule sets. And um, that you can see right here, the things that are coming up is going to be doing dependency scanning uh, enabled via a click, which we're borrowing from Taylor. So I'm very glad he got that work done so we can uh, quickly roll that one out. Here was the automatic remediation that I was referencing. You're gonna start being able to see widgets in your vulnerability list to tell if there's an automatic remediation available to you. And then this is how we're gonna be showing the pathing information. So if you go to the dependency list project that you have, you're going to be able to click and see where that dependency is actually coming from. The last thing is, I, if you've seen, we have exit codes and allow failure now as a default part of GitLab. We're going to be utilizing this and introducing a specific exit code for all the scanners 
And right now it looks like that's gonna be exit code six. I'm gonna be publishing a blog post about this, that we have consistent behavior between all the AST scanners about what does a failure within the pipeline mean? And we've seen some user confusion over this. So I'm like really excited to bring consistency across the scanners uh, for users here. So as you can see, most of our stuff has just been around adoption through usability. And that's focusing on addressing bugs, making things work smoothly, making things easier to understand and consistency between all of the products. So now I'll hand it over to Derek. If I can find my mute button. All right. So I'm Derek Ferguson, uh, the PM for Dynamic Analysis. So I'm going to cover what we've done and what we're going to do in the uh, DAS scanner. Uh, so over the past few releases, we've released quite a bit uh, to uh, improve the on-demand DAS experience. Uh, so one of the big things that we added was the ability to validate your sites uh, so that you can run active scans against them. Uh, so you can see whether the validation has failed or succeeded. You can retry validation or revoke it. And that works in a, uh, concert with the active mode so that uh, when you go into your scans, uh, you can see that uh, the scan mode is active and the target URL, uh, it won't let you run the scan if you have not validated that website. Uh, this also shows something new that we added where you're able to save the on-demand DAS scans. This allows you to create your configuration once rather than having to recreate it every single time. So when you go into manage your DAS scans, all you have to do is click run scan and it will automatically uh, go through all of the uh, steps that you've already configured for that scan. Uh, this should make it a lot more uh, uh, quick to run these scans and to, uh, to get the results that you're looking for. So going into what we are planning on doing, one of the big things that I am excited for is the fact that we're going to be aggregating uh, some of these incredibly noisy uh, DAS vulnerability scans into a single vulnerability. Previously, we would uh, report uh, possibly hundreds or even thousands of these, depending on how many pages you had or URLs you had on your website. What we're going to be doing is aggregating all of these into a single vulnerability and show you how many places on your site uh, that vulnerability was found. Uh, that's going to help a lot with the uh, dashboard and vulnerability reports. Uh, then we're going to be adding uh, the remaining options that are missing from the DAS site profile. Uh, these include the website or API selection, authentication, request headers, and excluded URLs uh, to finish off the on-demand configuration and uh, really release our on-demand scans as a full uh, GA. All right, and uh, the last thing that I'm very excited about is we're working on a few new uh, scanners and crawlers for DAST. Uh, so the big two that we're working on are Browserker and Peach. Uh, so the Peach API uh, scan is going to extend what we already have for our API scanners and provide a lot of new options uh, for that. And Browserker, uh, we will be initially using as a new spider to crawl uh, Ajax, uh, JavaScript heavy, single page applications, uh, modern uh, web frameworks so that we can find more pages and increase our DAS scan coverage. All right, and with that, I will hand it over to Sam. All right, thanks, Derek. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll jump in. So right now I'm sharing the category direction page for fuzz testing. We have a lot of great information on here. Would love for you to check it out, provide your feedback. But really, I want to jump to a couple sections to go through with you, starting with some recent highlights of things that we are excited to have shipped in the past few releases. And the first one of those is that we've added additional language support for coverage guided fuzz testing. We know that our users develop applications in many different languages. And being able to do fuzz testing of all the code inside of the application, whether it's in C, JavaScript, Python, whatever language, is really important to help finding those bugs and vulnerabilities that other tools are going to miss. Another area we recently enhanced our API fuzz testing 
is we integrated the results directly into the security dashboard. If you're familiar with what our first iteration looked like, the security results were in the test tab inside of a pipeline using our JUnit output. And this was great as a first iteration to show you those security results, but API fuzz testing now is fully integrated just like any other GitLab scanner would. So if you look in the pipeline security tab, the merge request widget, or the security dashboard, you'll see those API fuzz testing results. And the last area I'd like to highlight is again around API fuzz testing. And it says first delivery of API fuzz testing, but what I want to emphasize here is that we've really been doing a lot to enhance API fuzz testing from our first release. Um, we released this in 13.4 and we've continued to iteratively improve it release after release since, making it better for you. One of the main areas I'd like to highlight is that we added Postman collection support. So if you had an open API file or a HAR file, you can also now use a Postman file to fuzz your APIs. And those are three of the things that we recently released that I think you'll be excited to check out. If you wanna know more about where we're headed, we have a lot more information here and I'll highlight my top three that I think you'll be really excited to see. And the first one of those is allowing our coverage guide fuzzing users to manage corpus objects much more easily than they can today. Managing a corpus is all about telling the fuzzer this is what input should roughly look like so that the fuzzer can find more vulnerabilities, more bugs. And up to this point, this has been a very difficult workflow to create those corpus objects and provide them to, to the fuzzer. We're gonna be providing a new interface that we call the corpus registry. You can click the link there to view the Epic, uh, which will allow you to manage all of these graphically to very quickly get started. Additionally, we heard the feedback that API fuzz testing could be difficult to get started with, difficult to set it up. And so this is one of the areas that we're focusing on, making it easier to get started. And again, you can click the link there to check out what we're doing, but we're going to be providing a, a graphical user interface that will help guide you through that initial configuration, that initial setup. And when you're done entering all the data that you need to enter, you're gonna be given a code snippet that you can just directly copy and paste into your GitLab CI YAML file. This means you won't have to reference the documentation as much. You won't have to do debugging of a YAML file. You can just copy that snippet and you're good to go. And the final area I wanna highlight is that we're focusing right now on open sourcing some of the protocol fuzz testing technology that GitLab acquired from Peach Tech in 2020. This is really exciting, not just for GitLab, not just for you, but for the open source community as a whole. This is going to be releasing technology that's not been available in the open source world really ever up to this point. It's really going to help advance the state of the industry. And GitLab is really excited that we're gonna be able to do this and work with you in the open source community on it. Specifically, what's going to be in that open source offering is the core engine of the protocol fuzz testing from Peach. And this is going to let you get started with some initial protocols, build your own custom protocols if you like, and really extend it for whatever sort of specific application or use case you have. We would love your contributions. We'd love to work with you on this project because it is open source and at GitLab, everyone can contribute. And as we finish those open source efforts, we're then going to start shifting our focus to how do we integrate the open source project into GitLab as part of one of our paid tiers. And again, I mentioned there's a lot on this fuzz testing direction page. I would encourage you to check all of it out but that's what we're working on and what we've recently shipped. And I'll pass it back over to David now. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone. Um, those who are watching the video, we look forward to going through the questions you may have as part of our uh, review this Wednesday. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say, like, you know, click on the subscribe video if you're watching this. If you uh, are currently not following all, all of our videos, the Secure Stage produce a lot of videos per week, so please do that. And uh, just a, a last final call out, I think Taylor would also like to see you hit the like button if you're liking the video as well. Um, I've never pointed, so I probably pointed at the wrong part of the screen, but hopefully you all will enjoy that when you get to the end of the video.